Good morning. Thank you for joining us for Easter Sunday. For over two decades, we have gathered in the sunken gardens to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every single year, it's been such a joy to see thousands of white chairs sprawled across the lawn, kids enjoying themselves in the kids' area, playing and worshiping, and a whole line of donuts on Anapamu. But this year, it's going to be looking a little bit different. We're going to be worshiping in our homes. We know that this has been a difficult season for a lot of people. We're living in a unique time when we are all going through the same thing at the same time. And we believe that this morning, we are going to bring a message of hope right to you. And you're about to hear a message of hope. You're about to listen to music that will hopefully enliven your hearts. And it is our desire that the love and joy of Jesus will enter into your homes. Jesus is alive and he loves you. Happy Easter. Good morning, Santa Barbara. Happy Easter. Let us worship Jesus, the risen King this morning. Amen. Here we go. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry the kind of way? It was my turn till I met you. Yeah. I was breathing the night. Alive, all my failures are tried to hide. It was my turn till I met you.
love awaken us this morning because his love lives and because he loves us we live amen Yeah. 
you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I've looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Father, that's our heart this morning, to look for you, to seek you, to know your power, your glory, your goodness, and your love this Easter morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Easter. He has risen. See, because here's the deal. Typically, there's a big response back from that. You go, he is risen. Everyone goes, he is risen indeed. If you've never done that before, think about how powerful it is that this morning, across the world, we can say this together. So I'm going to lead it off with he is risen. You're going to come back with he is risen indeed right in your own home. Okay? So here it is. He is risen. Yes, he's risen indeed. Good, excellent job. I think of what an amazing season this is for us as the church, that we get to gather in this manner at this time in the midst of such craziness that's going on. The reality for us is that globally speaking, we have never been more aware of an issue together as a planet than this time right now. And people are wondering, what's the next step? What, where's the hope? Where's the peace? Where's the love? Where, where's the healing that we need? And guys, this morning, we get to come together and look right into the face of hope and healing. And before we do that, I'm just so very aware that in the midst of the circumstances that the world is facing, there are heroes in every city There's heroes in every state, in every country, men and women who are serving as nurses and doctors and first responders. There are delivery people that are consistently bringing needs to the care packages to those who are in need. Maybe you're one of those heroes. Maybe you know a hero. We all know one of these heroes. We need to stop and pray together as a world and ask God to protect those who are standing on the front line this Easter morning. So will you join me? Father God, we're mindful today of so many who are giving of their life selflessly for those who are in trouble. And we'd ask now, God, a move of your spirit over each nurse and doctor and, and first responder and caregiver and lover and deliverer, and we ask an anointing upon them that you'd keep them safe that there'd be a supernatural blanket of protection around them. That, God, there'd be a boldness of character as they share love in the midst of dark places. That they'd bring a joy into some of those hospital rooms. And, and that there would be a change in atmosphere and heart in this world. God, we are asking you for mercy. We're begging God for healing and hope in the midst of this time. Today, my King, our King, we ask that you would meet us as we talk about this glorious day and the love that you gave that we might have hope. Meet us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If we don't have direction, we lose hope. 
And it's vital that now, more than ever, we become unified in heart and mind and press towards the one true God of all creation. It's a beautiful image to imagine a man or a woman surrendering their heart and their intentions and their focus on the one true God, on Jesus, on the Son. When I think about that posture, I'm reminded of this moment years and years ago. My daughter was about four years old. It was the night before Easter. And we went on a walk and we talked together about what Easter meant and she was wearing her new Easter dress. And we have outside our house at that time, we were near a a golf course and there was this long par five, almost 600 yard par five, uh, uh, hole 14. And it just went all the way towards where the sun would set. And we went at the high part of it together and we were just gonna walk down the grass and frolic while the sun was dropping. And there was this moment where Sarah couldn't handle it any longer. And she left my hand and just started running down the fairway. And there was this little spring Easter dress, this tiny little locks of hair, bing, 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 her hands wide open, and she just ran the whole way down. And I thought, that's how I want to seek my Jesus. That's how I want to, that's how God would want us to have our hearts and our minds focused on the place of peace. Guys, this is the time for us to rush in that manner towards goodness and hope and love. Look with me at Psalm 27, verse 4 and 5. If you have those at home, you can follow along with me. We'll also have it for you on the screen. This is one thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, listen, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me on a high upon a rock. The psalmist has such a picture in his heart of that rushing towards the place of hope and life and peace and comfort, the, the tabernacle, the secret place of God, where our feet are solid and we're guarded by the one who fashioned us and given hope for the things ahead of us by the power of all time, our God. So this is a place we're gonna rush to this morning as we consider Easter. But the the reality of this um, amazing account of love is that there's a a pre-story, a a, a pre-picture of love that happened before Easter morning. It didn't just happen on Easter morning. You see, Jesus of Nazareth was born here of a virgin and lived his life without sinning, uh, a pure lamb of God preparing his life and his heart to be ultimately the sacrifice for the sins of the world. We pick up considering his earthly ministry. He had about three years of ministry before he was placed upon the cross for the sins of the world. And in this time, if you would just imagine with me the love that was shared with the world. When, when Jesus came on the scene, it was, it was uh, revolutionary. It was transforming. People saw in him something they'd never seen before, right? A love, a walking love, a living, a powerful love right before them. From everything from his countenance, his eyes, his words, his touch, the way in which he functioned was so different than any other man had ever been. See, he was 100% man, but 100% God. And as he functioned in this manner, right, people were overwhelmed by it. Now, if you remember his ministry there in Galilee, he started very clearly with a message of preparation for the kingdom of uh, of heaven that there would be this sense of turning away from the world and now looking in a new direction. He's saying, get your posture right. Come to the one true son, right? And it's the kingdom of heaven and it's at hand, he would say. And so those who began to fall in love with Jesus and began to follow him heard of this heaven and this kingdom that was ahead and had this hope that was just rolling through their hearts. He would tell them that indeed each one that followed them would be more than just simply followers but that they'd be world changers, that they'd become citizens of heaven, connected brothers and sisters, sons of the most high, heirs, right, to the throne of God. I mean, just, we get get to this this heaven ahead of us, and so there became this sense of hope 
I, I can change the world. I, I can be salt. I can be light. I, I, can, I can love my neighbor as myself. I can love those who even persecute me and come against me. And so what you see from Jesus' ministry is now love flowing into those that were following and they were doing in like manner, loving and caring and being world changers. There was this great hope that was set before them. So much so, they left their homes and they'd follow him without any place to put their head. They would gather in fields and on hillsides and they would listen and Jesus would share one truth of the kingdom after another, love pouring from the Son of God to God's people. He would tell them that the Father hears and knows and answers the places they had hidden in their faith and thought of God, now Jesus is bringing a whole new understanding that God is intimate and he's personal, that there's not this law and this, 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 these steps to somehow get or this barrier between them and God, but that, that Jesus was coming to remove that barrier, to have that veil torn from the top to the bottom, to allow all men to rush in and be in the intimate place with the Almighty, right? To hide in the tabernacle, to be kept in the secret place with the King. And so Jesus is now giving them a hope, a freedom from trying to have it be good enough on their own or do the law just the right way. He was showing them God is near, heaven is near. Now, all the way through this ministry, Jesus was also um, revealing his power and authority over all creation, right? The water, the rain, and the storms, and so many times where he'd still a storm that was coming, and so they were overwhelmed with miracles. Uh, imagine how many people were tormented and broken by demonic forces and, 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 and um, every, every type of physical ailment, and Jesus was there touching and healing and restoring, even the leper, and no one would touch ostracized from his family, separated out, not allowed near his family again, no one, no touch, probably feeling a little bit like we have in this time, like, wait, I, I just want to shake someone's hand, I just want to hug someone again, but he had a higher level, and yet Jesus would press right through the social distancing issues, and he would touch the one who would die of this and heal them, and they'd be healed. Think about that moment with Peter. Peter has this great sense of faith, these moments, right, where he's like, oh, I get it, and he sees Jesus on the water, which makes no sense, and so his mind's trying to grab hold of that. His heart is overwhelmed with this idea that there is no one like Jesus. There is no love like I've, this is the one true love of all time, and he says, call to me, and I'll come to you. What a crazy thing to say, but you see, love prompted it. Hope prompted it. What he had seen and known prompted faith, and faith made him step out of that boat, of course, quickly, to be changed by the wind and the waves. And he looked around and in fear, right, begins to sink. And what did he say? Lord, help. Boom. Jesus was right there in a word, holding him, taking him back to the boat. We, we, we see droves of people, multitudes coming and being healed. Look with me at Matthew chapter four, verse 23. We get this glimpse into this ministry of love. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. That's who we love. And he heals and he has power over the disease and death and brokenness. And they were drawn to him because he was healing. And his hope, you see, he came to do more than just heal from sickness. He, he came to heal us from sin, to wash away that which keeps us from God, to do the work of sacrifice. This love was so overwhelming that it drew people that typically wouldn't follow Jesus, this synagogue ruler, he, he was at the end of his rope, he was at the last, his last straw, right, and his daughter is dying, and so he goes to the one who's healing and has hope, and as he heads towards the son, the king of glory, he asks for healing, and Jesus says, I will come, and there's hope for a moment, but it's shattered. As leaders come and say, oh, your daughter has already died, and here's what's so crazy, look, look, look with me in a moment in what Jesus said in verse 36 of Mark 5, as soon as Jesus heard that word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. 
See, love was over the noise of the crowd and the people proclaiming death and those that were just seeing all of the, 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 the hard parts of life and the dark parts of life. Love was past that and said, oh, no, no, no. Do not be afraid, only believe. And love held him and kept him and he restored and healed his daughter. This love would begin to speak about the coming payment that would be made. And Jesus would share with those that were following that indeed there was this moment where he was going to be handed over and crucified for the sins of the world. And they're trying to, again, process that. How do you process that? And understand that this love that lives with you, this love that walks with you and hope and this, this hope that so surpasses understanding that heals and restores and has power and authority and all that we want, how could he possibly go and die? But you see, love was showing he sacrifices. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, Jesus said this, and even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus was speaking a hope that they couldn't fully understand. We can. We now can understand. Remember John 3, 16? For God so loved the world. This is Jesus speaking. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever will believe on him will not perish but will have eternal life. See, they began to witness love sacrifice. I can't imagine what took place that last week in Jerusalem. If you've been with us hearing the teachings from Mark chapter 15 by uh, Pastor Guzik, you, you know the intensity of the cross. And here, all this hope, all this love, the kingdom, uh, the truths that were stared bef shared before them now was surrendered to uh, ungodly men who were scourging him and putting him upon the cross and nailing nails through his hands and through his feet. And love was dying right before their eyes. It was dying on the cross. And they'd hear this love cry out to the Father, it is finished. And they'd see his lifeless body put in the tomb. And the darkest of nights, the hardest of sorrow for those that were following. Jesus. The one they could hold and touch and see was now being placed in the tomb and the stone rolled in front and a seal by the religious leaders and, and by the Roman soldiers standing in front of it. See, they weren't gonna lose this body. They were gonna let, were gonna let these rebels win with their story that indeed their Messiah would rise again, right? They're, they're not gonna do that. And so every bit of power and authority they, they had, boom, slam, snap, big rock right in front, closing the tomb completely. Oh, but you see, the story's not over. In the midst of the sorrow, in the midst of the sadness and grief, we pick up with some of the disciples as they come to the tomb. In Mark chapter 16, verse one and two, listen to this. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. This early morning, there, there's, there's something about early morning and the sun rising up, it's the hope of a new day, this, this sense of, wow, God's still in control and the sun rises on the good and the evil and it rises for me. And the darkness of their heart and soul, they still knew where to go. They wanted to get their hands on Jesus somehow, finish the process of death to anoint him and love him and, and worship him. And so they headed to the tomb. Guys, this is the direction of the heart that we need in the midst of sadness, is we need to run towards the sun, to press towards the one. When the world is upside down and it's overwhelming, we just have to move towards Jesus. It didn't make any sense, just like it didn't make any sense to Peter in that process. It made no sense to them as they watched the things that Jesus did before them. And yet here, these ladies, they move towards the tomb. Maybe remembering some of the words that Jesus had spoken to them. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, after sharing with them not to worry, 
not to worry about your food or what you'll eat or what you'll drink or what you'll wear. You're rising up, you're lying down. Don't worry about it. Your God has it. But he would say this in verse 33 and 34. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things, things shall be added to you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient is the day is its own trouble. Don't worry about it. God's got it. But you guys, we can't get that unless we press our heart towards the one. And they were moving towards Jesus in the midst of a hard trouble. But they knew somewhere in their heart that, that, that their king, the one who promised that indeed press in, seek the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things shall be added that there'll be hope in it. And so they press on. Now, now look a little bit farther in the story in verse three. He says, and so they said amongst themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? So imagine these ladies and they get the spices together and they're speaking of their love. We must be near Jesus. And they prepare, and then they make the journey outside the gate to Golgotha, or to, to the tomb that would be near in the, in, the, in the garden. And as they're making this journey, it dawns on them, there's a big stone. There's a giant rock, and it's sealed, and there's guards. Who's going to do it for us? Who's going to roll away the stone? Guys, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe some of us this morning, maybe you this morning are thinking the same thing. You feel the weight maybe of sin in your heart or the distance that you've had with your God. Maybe you've never known him. And just now you're beginning to dawn that there's a stone that's been covering your heart. The condition of being separated out and your heart's been longing for something deeper, longing for something great. And the question may be in your heart, who will remove the stone? Who will take away this burden and give me life? Who will do it? And they ask this question, longing, wondering, who is going to roll the stone? It's a big stone. Well, let's see. In verse 4, it said, but when they looked up, they saw that that stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. Jesus didn't have to move the stone. <laughs> He's the Son of God. When he rose from the dead, he can do whatever he wants to. He would show himself to over 500 witnesses. Doors didn't keep him, walls didn't keep him. He could be right there before them, revealing that he had been raised from the dead. But he opened the tomb. I believe with all my heart he knew that these sweet, faithful disciples were going to come looking for him. And he's like, take a look, ladies. I'm not here, I've beat death. You are now have the opportunity to be more than an overcomer. I've taken the sting out of death for all mankind, for all who will come unto me. And they peer inside the tomb. Look in verse five. And so entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were very alarmed. <laughs> if things don't get crazier, they go to their king and listen, you should be ready. If you're seeking the God of all creation with all of your heart and you're moving towards him, God will show you and bring miracle and hope and love into your life. He will, that's what he does. And so the stone is away. Soldiers are on their face. They peer in and see an angel. And the angel gives them a message. Of course, they're alarmed. What's gonna be the next thing? But he said to them, do not be alarmed, which is really all through the scriptures, what angels say first. If you run into a true angel, it's like, do not be alarmed because you're gonna know it. He said, you seek Jesus of Nazareth who is crucified. He is risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. Love lives. He is alive from the dead for you and for me. He gives us a hope eternal. And even though the, the world is crumbling and the things around us are crazy, we have hope eternal because he rose and he revealed himself to them. Now, now the angels in, in, Mar, in Luke's gospel gives a, give us a little nugget of what the angels also said to them in, in, in chapter 24, verse seven. They said, they, they quoted what Jesus had said to them. 
the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. The angel says, don't, don't you get it? Everything Jesus told you happened. Crucified, Jesus of Nazareth, placed upon the cross, buried in the tomb, risen from the dead. He paid this price for sin once for all, the disease and brokenness of sin that every man will have to pay. Guys, there may be some of us that don't get this virus that's out there, but every single one of us has the disease of sin and it must be taken care of. It has to be. We have a great place on our website and it's um, help, it's our, it's our Love on Mission page and really there's opportunities there to, to uh, share a need, to share a desire to help with a need and just to participate in giving and supporting, helping those who are in need. And the first statement across the, the top of the page or on that page says, do you want to help with the coronavirus? And a friend of mine, as we were looking at this, said, yes, I, I want to get rid of it. Tell me how much to write the check for. And another friend in the room said, it's going to cost your son. And I thought in that moment, could I give my boy for that for everyone? I couldn't. but my Father in heaven did. My Father in heaven, our Father in heaven, gave his only begotten Son, that whomsoever believes on him will not perish but have everlasting life. He gave his Son to pay for the sins of the world, to wash us clean and to make us new. We, we don't have to pay the price we get inoculated by the king and he washes us clean and we're set free with a hope. And yes, there's still trouble in this world. And yes, it's still hard. But now we know the truth and the way. You see, when he was heading to the cross, his disciples were beside themselves. They're, they're wondering what's going to happen next. And, and Jesus said, listen, don't worry. Don't be heavy troubled in your heart. I'm going to my father's house to prepare a place for you. And if it wasn't so, I would have told you. But, but I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. And the disciples, as they were receiving this love before he was put on the cross, were saying to themselves, wait a minute, wait a minute, how, how could this possibly be? Right? Thomas speaks up and he goes, wait, wait, how do we know the way to your father's house? And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life that no one gets the Father except through me. Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the doorway to the kingdom of heaven. And he knocks on the door of your heart and says, do you want to come in? Let me into your heart and I will be your king. I will be your Lord forever. I will rule and reign in your heart and I will give you an everlasting peace. And now, guys, what happens to us when we welcome Christ and ask him to forgive us of our sins is now we can run to the Son. We have the hope of everlasting life before us that directs our path. Maybe this morning you've been aware of that stone in your heart, that barrier between you and everlasting life, and today you want to put your trust in Jesus Christ. I want to give you an opportunity right at home to welcome Jesus, to ask for your sins to be forgiven and to be washed clean by his sacrifice and set free and made alive as he was risen from the dead that you may walk in new life as well. And so I want to lead, lead you in a prayer right now as we're talking. I, 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 I want to, well, as, as I'm talking, and if you would like to ask Jesus in your life, you can pray this prayer right along with me while you're watching on TV or you're watching on your computer. You can grab the hand of loved ones right in your room. You can bow your head and pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I confess I'm a sinner. And I need your forgiveness. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would come in and wash my heart clean, remove the stone of sin from my heart. 
Make me your own. Fill me up with your love and give me the hope of heaven. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. What a blessing. And if you pray with me at home, here's the deal. Like that. Like that. You know, I'm so aware right now, you are too, of just the washing of hands, right? We do different songs. I've been saying Psalm 23, yeah, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It, it, it's, it takes a good 40 seconds, and you're doing it, and you're getting the fingernails and the whole deal, just like you're going in for surgery, and it takes forever to get them clean, till you feel like, ha oh, ha oh, I've cleaned it up. It takes like that for your sins to be washed away. You are forgiven and made new. I want to encourage you now as a family, as we consider just moving forward in this world, because this truth that now you've received in your heart, or maybe you've known, and now it's coming into clo- a greater focus, and, or maybe God's just really even removed some stoniness and some doubt and some fear and anxiety from your heart, and you remember the true God, and you remember the hope of that. I, I want to give you some encouragement, church and family, to how we walk. Look with me at John, 1 John, verse 1 through 4. Now, John got to look into the face of love. (laughs) He got to see it and put his hands upon it and understood the fullness of this love like nobody else. He saw the healing and the hope and the strength and the words and the, the crucifixion and the burial and the resurrection, and he felt the Spirit of God come upon him. And here's how John would proclaim this in his epistle, 1 John. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the, cons- the, 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 the word of life. The life was manifested And we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. He says, I want to share that testimony. That love, that life, that Jesus, I've handled him. I've seen him. I've heard him. I've received him. I know him. The Father has manifested his love for us through Jesus who endured to the cross for the sins of the world and has risen again. And he says, this truth I make manifest to you by the Spirit of God. He wanted us as a church, as a people, as his children, not to be weary and to freak out and to not know where to go, but to have a hope and go, no, I've handled it. He's removed the stone. He set me free. I belong to him and to him alone and to look that way and then to make him known to others. He says, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly, I love this, truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ, and these things we write to you that your joy may be full, may be full to overflowing. We make this truth known We get fellowship, guys. Here's the good news. We have fellowship with the Father and with His Son and His Holy Spirit dwelling within us, and we're one. And now that is power. That's what will cause you and I, each day this coming season, to wake up and to run towards the Son and to press into the One who's redeemed us, to hold tight to His hands and hear Him say, do not fear, only believe. For I am the way, for I am the truth, And I am the life, and there is no other way to the Father except by me. Lord God, this morning we love you. And now we pray as a family across the world and all who are watching and ask God that you'd stir up in us this confession that it would be bold and purposeful, that we would make it manifest to our family and to our friends in love and sacrifice and hope and good words and and love to those that are around us. God, would you empower us as your people to have a powerful confession of hope in the midst of darkness. We hold your hand, dear shepherd, as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death And we'll fear no evil for you are with us because my king, you are the way and the truth and the life. Amen. Let's worship.
Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion, you are my hiding place. I believe you are the way, the truth. pray that that will be just what flows through your heart in this season. You're the way. You're the truth. You are the life. And I believe in you. And I believe you, Jesus. And I know you. Today we got to settle into this love story and hear the, the, the hope that love brings, the, the healing that love brings, the sacrifice that love makes, and that love lives. It lives. It doesn't hide away. Can't hide it under a bushel. It's alive. He's alive. He is risen. He's risen indeed. He's alive from the dead to the glory of the Father that we might have life evermore. Ah, oh, in a few moments, Pastor Daniel and Pastor Zach are going to share just a little bit in wrapping up. And 
I just want you to know that you are loved in this time. You are prayed for in this time. That together we get to run towards the sun, delighting in our King with a hope that surpasses understanding. God bless you this Easter day. We love, love, love you. What a powerful message we just heard from Pastor Tommy. And we're gonna take a few moments just to tell you what it's like to pursue a relationship with Jesus. I remember when I began following Jesus as my Lord and Savior 15 years ago, and it was the best decision that I ever made. And the transformation that it brought into my life was incredible. And I'm so excited for you if you prayed to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you did that, your sins have been forgiven and Jesus has given you eternal life. Jesus brings out our potential. And as we draw closer to him day by day, he transforms us. And we become transformed and we become new when we pursue him in prayer, which is just talking with him, when we pursue him in his word, and when we fellowship with other believers in the church. While we're not gathering together on Sunday mornings at Calvary Chapel Santa Barbara, we would still love to connect with you. You can watch services online every Sunday at 9 and 11 and reach out to us online. Send us an email or call us. We would love to give you a Bible. We would love to pray for you and just encourage you in the decision that you made today to follow Jesus. We love you all. Happy Easter. Happy Easter.